turn on. Hi everybody, it's Hillary Michelle for the Hive Live Coffee Hour. Hello. I'm gonna turn off my air conditioning. I'll be right oh, back. Yep. Take it away, Michelle. Hi, <laughs> how are you? So we have some great questions for today, but before that, we wanted to make a couple of Hive announcements. Yes, like. thank you. Like, tomorrow starts our at-home Hive camp. This is created by kids for kids, uh, which I think is very cool. Um, my daughter Dee and a couple of her best friends decided that they wanted to bring something to the world for those parts of the summer where summer camp is over. But... Uh, School has not yet started. Because um, we still have three more weeks. Three more weeks. So this is, think of this as almost like your at-home vacation Bible school or a little spirituality camp. Um, and it's gonna, all you have to do is go on the Hive webpage and you will have the little packet that is like a booklet to, to follow along with different suggestions and themes for every day, as well as a little cut out do-it-yourself um, patch all the Girl Scouts, um, and those are those are for the taking. And every day, Dealey and I will pop up at sometimes probably random times during the day to do mm -hmm. uh, little Facebook Live videos about what we're doing for the Hive Camp, and you're welcome to join along. So, Hive Camp sounds good. Yes, they will also be repeated on the YouTube channel. So let's say next week you still have camp, so you don't need to do this yet. That's okay. You can still get all the information you need and follow along at your own schedule later on. Yes, it looks good. Thank you. Yeah. Delia is very excited for it. We tried out a couple things. So. Oh, good, good, good. good. Awesome. Um, let's see, so the other announcement we had was about books. Mm -hmm. So we were just talking about this, two different things. First, we're going to do at the end of this month, Monday the 27th, I think, we'll post it. Um, it has been posted. The book called Note to Self, so it's about creating a way of, uh, a rule of life, sorry. And this comes out of um, general convention with the Episcopal Church has just really started this emphasis on looking at you as a, a whole person, as a follower of Jesus, um, and uh, like seven different areas. But anyway, one of the things that comes out of that is creating this um, rule of life for yourself. How do you live into your faith um, and be genuine to who you are? And it's not cumbersome, it's meant to be life-giving. So we have this book called Notes <coughs> to Self that we're gonna read, and um, August is coming to a close quickly, so what we'll do is we'll read it, we'll get together, some people may not have finished it, and that's okay. And then just talk about how we can support each other in creating a rule of life. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we finally picked a, we picked a fun book, one of my favorite books. Yes, so. mm -hmm. yes, um, Gilead. Well, you've actually read it, I haven't yeah. yet. So uh, the book is called Gilead, it's a, it's a um, for what I understand, a really beautiful piece of mm -hmm. fiction about a Baptist pastor writing to his son. I think he might be um, Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Okay, Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. And it's about him and his family life. And it's it's a really nice book. It's an easy read. Good I've read it twice. Fiction. I'll yeah. read it again. I I liked it. It's it's easy to read. And there's a follow up book to it. So if you like it. You can keep reading. Yes. So, so, uh, t so now you know, A Note to Self will be our next book. And then after that, Gilead. So you are now up to speed on some of the things for the Hive coming up in the fall. We have a lot more planned, but those are some things you can prepare for now. So sounds exciting. Yep. We got a lot of great questions this, this time around. Too many questions to answer, in fact. So if you do not hear your question ads asked, don't worry. We will get to them at another time. Um, I'm a little under the weather myself, so we're going to keep this a little shorter today and just answer a few of them. Um, but please do, as I said, tune in again for another coffee hour because you will, you will see some more of those questions answered at a date to, to come up. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one, though, was uh, it dealt with biblical women. Michelle. Yeah. So the question was about who are some of the biblical women who we can study as leaders or who are examples or, you know, what, who is out there to study and yeah. what would you recommend reading? So we thought of a couple things. The first place was to go to the Bible. Yay. Um, I would recommend looking at the, the book of Matthew. So looking at the very first uh, gospel <coughs> book that you find, the very first part of it, and chapter one is super dry. It's a genealogy and most people skip those. Mm -hmm. But... I think this is the most exciting genealogy Don't in the whole Bible. Don't skip this one. Don't <laughs> skip this one. Read it. Because, um, <coughs> so the most of what you find in the Old and New Testament is pretty patriarchal, so it's very, like, man-centric. But, um, 
Jesus before he was even born, pushing against the grain. In his, uh, in the line, you know, leading up to his family, we see some women. So there's a lot of men, but we also have women, five to be exact, and they are Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, who is not listed as Bathsheba in the genealogy. It's the wife of Uriah, and there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have. Uh, and then Mary, who is, this is not actually her genealogy, it's her right. husband. Right. But um, <coughs> and the, these women are awesome. And Ruth, right? And Ruth, I'm sorry, I That's forgot okay. Ruth. How could you forget Ruth? So Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, and Mary. Mm-hmm. And if you read their stories in the Old Testament, they're very uh, rule-bending, pushing the yeah. envelope women. Yeah. They didn't really play by the rules. But the other interesting thing about them is with exception of Mary, none of them were Jewish. That's right. And so you have this Jewish lineage with these women who are on the outside. Um, one of them was a prostitute. One of them pretended to be a prostitute to continue a family line. Another one did some shady things to continue the family yeah. line. Another one um, <coughs> became uh, the love of King David while she was still married to another man. Mm-hmm. And then you have Mary, who is, you know, we esteem her as very holy and wonderful, but at her time to have been a teenager pregnant out of wedlock, you could have, people didn't think yeah. that was God's no, son. No, <laughs> they didn't. In fact, uh, she's lucky to make it out alive from that part of yeah. the story. It's really true. Uh, yeah, I love, uh, I love these women because it shows you not only the depth of the amazing things God can do with, with our lineage, right? You know, mm-hmm. that he can take any person in it. And, and, uh, even if there are parts that some people might say are troubling in our past, whatever, God can change that and make it a sign of his love. But the other thing is it also shows just kind of the different varieties of, of literature tradition that's mm-hmm. in there. So, um, we have some women in there that are considered, uh, in the, the Jewish, um, lit- uh, um, kind of literature view of, of a trickster, you know, yeah. somebody who is maybe not always morally correct, mm-hmm. but they still are the hero of the story yeah. because they have wisely and shrewdly um, uh, proven the, the holier yeah. point, even by maybe unholy means. Yeah. But um, So there's there's variety in it, which is amazing. There, And I think that they're interesting women to study today and our time because there are people who don't lose the forest for the trees yeah. and they kind of see mm-hmm. the bigger picture of like I I'm trying to take care of my family or mm-hmm. you know live according to this particular way yeah. and there's no way for me to do it correctly <laughs> and dot you know all my I's and cross all my T's so yeah. what am I gonna do mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So. absolutely yeah um, anybody on that list in particular you want to lift up <sighs> um oh they're all so good What's your favorite? I'll start with Ruth. Um, she, Ruth, if you haven't read the book of Ruth, it's worth reading. She's the only one who has her own book. That's right, that, which is something to mention in its own right, you know, that Ruth actually gets named as her own book. Ruth starts out her story um, by following her mother-in-law after she's been widowed um, to, to go into her mother-in-law's um, country where she is a foreigner and mm-hmm. where often foreigners are not met with... No hooray, you're here. They, they're often seen as outsiders and suspicious, but she stays with her mother-in-law because she's devoted to her yeah. and says, you know, no, I'm, I am your family now. Where you go, I will go. Um, by doing that, she can then, can, then continues on and, um, and marries Boaz, uh, who ends up um, helping, helping her, graft her into this lineage, too, of uh, what will soon be King David's lineage. Uh, but she does it she persists with kindness in a way that is not like a doormat type of mm-hmm. kindness, you know. So when sometimes we think of Ruth's story, we think of, oh, a nice person who who loves her mother-in-law and she, you know, she she does what it takes. No, she she loves with a fierceness, yeah. like I, like that. My life is now yoked with your life, and that's mm-hmm. woven into G- Jesus's DNA. Mm-hmm. You know, like, and that's why I like to think about with these genealogies, like what what these women have given him and his into his DNA and a fierce 
um, a fierce love that won't let go, mm -hmm. that comes, I think, from through Ruth's DNA lineage, you know, like that, yeah. I'm not going to let go of I mean, you. she has this new family, kind yeah. of like Jesus keeps yeah. being asked, you know, um, about his mother and yeah. father. It shows up again <laughs> and again in the gospel, and he'll say things like, well, who are my mother and father? Or, yeah. you know, I, I'm not who you think I am. I'm not just the carpenter's son. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, she she has an opportunity yes. um, to go back to her family in this story and her family of birth and she decides to stay in this family that she's been grafted into and what's so beautiful about the story you mentioned um, you know where you go I will go yeah. there's some of the <coughs> some of the the liturgy in a marriage comes yes. from this book like Absolutely. this love that she has for her mother-in-law yeah is so deep um, and and that, the other thing about this story that's so great even though you see a lot of, you know, the foreigner is an outsider. Mm -hmm. There's still these provisions in the story for people who are poor. Yes. And you see you see how that, that kind of factors into the yeah. story too. So. Well, that, that within God's people there is always room, mm -hmm. always uh, expected that you will be taking care of people who are not first and foremost born into the into your lineage. I love that. You're, you're so right to lift that up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd also like to highlight Bathsheba, give a little little shout out to Bathsheba. Um, I think that uh, we've been in the lectionary, we've been following along the she David saga, yeah. yeah, especially She's two weeks today. ago and today, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the the David saga, uh, like if if you, it's a, mess. it's a mess, but it's amazing. It's one of it's one of the most um, uh, all encompassing life stories we have in the Bible. We get more of David's story than we do of Jesus' story. Mm -hmm. well, you know, from him as a little boy, what happened to him afterwards. And it and the arc of his story seems to go up, 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 down, 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 down. Um, which is which I think is a true story in that mm -hmm. there's truth in it. It's not all hooray, King David, all great all the time. And there's consequences to David's choices yes. and to Bathsheba's choices. So you see these people who are faithful, who are loved by God, but who really screw up. Mm -hmm. And they don't get a pass just because <laughs> they love right. God or because they're royalty. Yeah. So if you do, if you're not familiar with the story, um, David is uh, he is now king. He is installed in his royal palace. He looks out and he sees Bathsheba, a, a beautiful woman, taking a bath on her rooftop, cleansing herself after her her time of menstruation, which comes back into the story because he calls her over, um, and now it's, she's in her fertile time, um, and they lay together as the scripture uh, uses a euphemism for um, and she she gets pregnant comes back and tells him later that she is pregnant and this is when David goes from from having made a very bad mistake one that uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and say if you're putting a modern lens on could fall into a me too moment I think because he mm -hmm. uses his power um, in ways that we don't we don't know Bathsheba's response in it, right? Like she, it's not as like we don't know. It's summoned by a king, so you don't know how much room she had to. Yes, I mean we know he was like this really attractive guy. We know that from says, scripture, but but we don't know. but we don't know anything about how. Like, oh, so so you're left wondering, you know. I mean, her husband is out fighting a war. Uriah, her husband, is out fighting a war for David. So and he's a foreigner fighting for David. Exactly. So he's a super loyal guy. Yes. <laughs> so you wonder if she thinks to herself. Do I need to to be with David to save my husband? Even who knows? And the point is, we don't. But it's worth wondering about that power mm -hmm. differentiation. Um, so the so from there, Bathsheba summons David, or doesn't summon. She tells David, "I'm with child." David starts this plot um, of of several ways of getting out of the mess he's created. The first is he calls. <laughs> yes, he makes it so much worse. It's that classic when first we. Practice to what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. This is David's <laughs> moment of that, um, where you know first he calls Uriah back from the battlefront and says, "Hey, it's great you're back. Why don't you go back to your house and like have some fun with your wife?" He gets him drunk. He gets him totally drunk and sends him home to lay with Bathsheba. Uriah won't leave. He he instead sleeps at the palace doors with the rest of the soldiers. And when David says, "Why didn't you go home?" He's like, "Well, how can I go home? I'm still fighting a war for you." Mm -hmm. You know, like Uriah is this guy who like your heart breaks. Guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. And um, so then David thinks, "Well, this isn't working. I can't take uh, Uriah can't unwittingly take uh, take 
the, the, the care for the son, you know. And so instead, he sends him out onto the battlefield and then has all of the troops, like... He puts him in the front of the yeah, line and tells yeah. him to draw back. Yeah, the troops draw back so that Uriah just takes all of the hits. It's, okay. it's t and he even makes Uriah bring the note to the general to tell them what to do. It's, it's, it's bad. It's bad. And, and, and so you have that. And eventually, like, David, through, through the prophets, like, 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 here's what he's done. And, and is very much like, oh, no, I've, I have messed this all up. Mm -hmm. And they repent. And, yes, there's consequences, terrible consequences that we hear throughout the rest of the story. But that's also part of Jesus' DNA. Like, let's mm -hmm. think about that again, like, back to the Jesus and the women in Jesus' story. Like, like the fact that Jesus' lineage is not squeaky clean yeah. and, and the fact that David is not disowned by God, yeah. nor is Bathsheba, um, I think matters. Because I don't know about you. I do know about you. But, like, <laughs> but I'll, I'll hold it for myself. My, my family's, like, lineage is not squeaky clean. I don't know a single... Mine is. Is it? <laughs> Never mind, then. You've proven my point. <laughs> no. no. I don't know a not. single person in this world who's, who doesn't have some part of their family who, who, at some point, you're like, well, this is the part that we tell this part of the story, you know, in hushed tones. You know, like, there's, yeah. there's no one. There's no one on earth that has a perfectly squeaky clean, not even Jesus. Yeah. In fact, Jesus is part of one of the most epic family weird stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's... That matters to me. Yeah. Like, like yeah. that, like her, her witness in Jesus's mm -hmm. lineage matters to me because of that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think there's so much that could be said about all these yeah. ladies. We could take up yeah, a no, couple hours. I'll, no, no, I'll no, 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 no. <laughs> but I think they're worth reading mm -hmm. and Tamar, you should yes. read her story sometime. Yes. It's super crazy. Yes. But what I'll say too is, um, <coughs> I think that that this also endears Jesus towards these kind of women because Certainly. you wanted to talk about Mary Magdalene yeah. in a second. But, yeah. um, <coughs> you yeah. know, a lot of the women that Jesus speaks with in, in his story, um, they're, they're not reputable women. They're not, a lot of them have sexual sin. And to, to be honest, like that's, that's what you see with women yeah, in, 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 the Bible. in the Bible. And then today, if a woman's going to get a bad name, yeah. it often has to do with mm -hmm. sexuality. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, a man is just like, you know, good job, he's, buddy. He's and a woman is... Prowess. Other names are given to her. Um, <laughs> exactly. and, and so I think that one, these women are written out in the story of God. In yep. the story of Jesus are important. But two, like... These are in Jesus's family, and so of course he's in. D he has yeah. this big soft spot for these these women. It's his family too. It's yep. it's it's yeah. his own story. Yeah. So yeah, just just to lift up a few more women, um, ex in particular in the New Testament, um, some of my favorites obviously are his mom, I mean mm -hmm. Mary. Um, she is. Uh, she's a fierce prophet. Um, you know, when we think of Mary as meek and mild, I don't know where we get that from because when you <laughs> see her in scripture, she is talking to angels in a way that most men who have spoken to angels, like they cower in fear. Um, and instead she's like, okay, I'm, I'm scared, but tell me more. Yeah. You know, like she, she, uh, even her, her most famous piece of, uh, of poetry called the Magnificat, um, where she describes how God's work is going to happen through her. Um, it's revolution. It's a it's very call. Political. It's political. It's a call to revolution. It's like, you know, the, the lofty will be turned on, you know, on, yeah. on their heads. Um, the poor shall be rich. The, the hungry shall be fed. Mm -hmm. And all of it is happening through me, his handmaiden. Like she's, she's awesome. So don't ever discount Mary. She's not meek and mild. Like go and learn more about Mary. She's incredible. Um, and Jesus learns it from her. Like, and she starts his ministry. She pushes him. Yes, He's not she ready. Does. And she says, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Go do <laughs> it. And he's like, okay, mom. <laughs> so Mary's amazing. Um, Mary Magdalene, um, a, a character that has been um, inaccurately portrayed as a, a prostitute. prostitute. Yes, again, like we were just saying, um, because of a sermon that Pope Gregory gave uh, in the Middle Ages. So that's actually inaccurate. She, mm -hmm. is, she is not a prostitute. Um, however, she is, um, I think she is associated with two major pieces of Jesus's sacramental ministry, exorcism 
and anointing. Mm -hmm. Exorcism, because she has, uh, when we're introduced to her first in the gospel, mm -hmm. exactly, she is said to have been um, uh, possessed by seven demons from which she is cleansed. Mm -hmm. When we read the Gospels and we see different types of liturgical action, like, like baptism, for example, or the New Testament, we can ascribe that to certain disciples being able to teach that later on. Like baptism and Peter, for example, will right. only go hand in hand. I think exorcism and Mary Magdalene go hand in hand because I think what we know in the New Testament about exorcism comes from having, her having learned it from Jesus. Yeah. She was the person who, more than anybody, like was actually there <laughs> and saw. On top of that, she does this incredible triple anointing action. Mm -hmm. um, she is there uh, at the very beginning of his, his journey into Jerusalem towards the cross where she anoints his feet. Mm -hmm. um, she is there where, um, and even if that's metaphorical, there's still a, a tie-in. Um, she is there when he is taken off of the cross, mm -hmm. which would have had an anointing moment as well. Mm -hmm. She is there at the tomb where she is going to anoint him. It's a triple action that that draws a chord throughout the entire Paschal mystery, mm -hmm. um, which is amazingly important today because anointing is still a liturgical action, I think, underappreciated in the church, um, mm -hmm. but conveys a huge act of healing. Um, so I, yeah, don't underestimate any of these women. They're, yeah. they're important. Yeah. Um, it's funny cause last week I came home from something after church and my husband was at home watching, uh, <coughs> the Chronicles. Of, he was really watching the line, the wish in the wardrobe yes. with my kids. And, um, <coughs> I got there about the time that Aslan was being killed and it was I know a lot of people like love to see all the symbolism yeah. in C.S. Lewis, and I'm eh. okay. <laughs> but I I watched it, and the you know it's these two little girls who are sitting there yeah. with um, Aslan, watching him be killed, and then they sit with him yes. in his death while everybody else is away at war and doesn't yes. even know what's happening or are afraid. And they sit there with him when he's resurrected, and they don't understand what's happening, but they listen. And I thought, oh yeah. That's totally what we hear yeah. women doing in the yep. Bible. They're there, even when they don't understand. So don't yes. under, underestimate the power of women in Absolutely. Scripture. Just because they may be underrepresented doesn't mean that they aren't some of the most powerful figures. If you're interested in learning more, there is a great book that I would like to show you, but it's actually I'll propping... It. Okay, you're going to hold it. the phone. Yeah, it's propping up the phone. It's called um, Bible Women, Their Words and Why They Matter, and um, it's by Lindsay Harden Freeman, um, by published by Forward Movement. Um, I'm hoping that she will maybe be a guest someday uh, on, on The Hive, um, because I really like this book. Um, let's see if it holds up. Is it? We got it. Sorry, Michelle, Michelle you keep the, talking. Michelle's the IT crew right now. Um, <laughs> That's not good. The, uh, this book it goes through and finds the words of women absolutely everywhere in the Bible, including some that you maybe didn't even notice mm -hmm. before. Um, it's worth picking up and looking at because uh, because yeah. it's it's not to be missed. So that's our little thing about biblical women. Yes. Yes. I think we had a question um, that's a kind of easy one about what is a spiritual director? Um, a spiritual director is somebody who has been trained, may or may not be clergy, but somebody who has been trained in spiritual practices as well as um, some understanding of pastoral care um, to help guide a person in their relationship with God. So think of it, I don't like to say think of it as a therapist. It's, it's, right. it's very different. Um, it's somebody who can say, um, you know, you're in a desert moment with God and your relationship. Mm -hmm. Let's find a, let's find your root out of the desert. Or you're in a great place with God right now. Like, let, how do how do we go yep. deeper? Um, so, if you're looking to go, uh, to take a real deep dive with your own personal spirituality. A spiritual director is is great to to find. Yeah, yeah. You you work with one. I work with I one. Do. Yeah, you know mine. I do. I love your <laughs> spiritual director. She's amazing. You know who you are. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think. I think it's meant to be life giving. I mean, I, I, it took me a long time to find a spiritual director. I was a little reluctant because yeah. I equated it with therapy. Yep. Um, and <laughs> again, those are two different things. Like, I have a spiritual director and I have a therapist, and they they function very differently. Very different. Very <laughs> um, different functions. Yeah. And I, I find 
spiritual direction to be very life giving, mm -hmm. um, which therapy can be too. Yes, but yes, and it, it, but these are very different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, I find it very <laughs> life giving because today we were talking at church about the way of love, mm -hmm. and um, you know, living into who you are as a follower of Jesus. Yeah, and I find that spiritual direction helps me find that and draw it out. You yeah. know, and draw out like what are the spiritual practices that I need to be participating in so that I I am following <coughs> Jesus and loving like Jesus so it's we're we're never meant to go it alone and right. that's what spiritual direction tells me and reminds me um obviously we have our fantastic ability to come together as a church which is beautiful for the corporate worship part but um, we're meant to be led by one-on-one -on -one teaching of, mm -hmm. and and a spiritual director is great. Mine is amazing. You know, Rita, if you're watching, I love you, girl. Um, but, she, you know, she helps me, um, you know, say, like, that's great, but could you go deeper? You yeah. know, like, like are, are you being real? You know, and I, I need that, you know, because it's, it's very easy to just drift along without, mm -hmm. without, in fact, I, um, I often go so far to say is if you're a clergy person in particular and you don't have a spiritual direction director, I think that's a little dangerous. Um, cause I don't know how you can be giving spiritual advice without have some, somebody giving you spiritual advice. Mm -hmm. So just FYI for you clergy people out there, there's Hillary's two cents. Um, okay. Anything else? I think that was all we were going to do today. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for all the coughing, guys, a little under the weather, but thank you for joining in, Busy Bees. <laughs> Just a quick reminder from the top of the class, um, we have the Hive Camp starting, which is, which is great, on Monday, follow along. We uh, are looking at Note to Self as our next book study, followed by Gilead as the one after that. I think that's it, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Bye, Busy Bees. Have a good one. I don't know how to stop this. Do you just finish? <laughs>